Another thing that we're really going to spend some time talking about is some different ecosystem dynamics. And ecosystem dynamics, meaning um, energy flow and nutrient cycling within an ecosystem. So we're talking both about the energy coming in. So in this case, we have sunlight coming in, um, coming into this tree. The tree is then going to go through the process of photosynthesis. Okay. Most specifically, the photosynthesis is going to occur in those chloroplasts. That's going to convert that solar energy into chemical energy. Okay. That chemical energy in the form of um, glucose, simple sugars, things like that. So here we have, um, now, now we have this chemical energy. So no, now it is um, able to be used by different organisms. That energy flow, that energy is stored in the bonds and married with that idea is that um, the nutrients are also recycling. So remember that energy is in the bonds. Well, what are the bonds between? The bonds are between atoms. And those atoms are the nutrients we're talking about here. Okay, those atoms are the nutrients here. So the two are going to move together. The difference being is that the energy is going to flow in just one direction, whereas those nutrients are going to be able to be recycled. So energy flows, nutrients, atoms really, cycle. Okay, some of the air you're breathing right now is the same air that a dinosaur um, breathed millions and millions of years ago. The oxygen on this planet isn't new. Okay, we are very much a closed system aside from a few meteorites and things like that, that that pepper our earth, right? What we have is what we have, which is one of those reasons why it's really critical that we also take care of it. But those nutrients are going to recycle. Sunlight comes in that's able to build those simple sugars. Now we have our glucose. Okay, that glucose can then be obtained by other organisms. The elephant here eating it. It's eating the glucose, so it's taking the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in. Those nutrients are going to be used to build its own body tissues or be passed on as waste. The energy that's holding those different bonds together is then going to be harnessed by that elephant and used for cellular work. Okay, the elephant's going to use that, and in mammals, a large part of the energy you consume is going towards maintaining an internal body temperature. So a lot of it's given off as heat, and when it's given off at heat, we can't recoup it, we can't reclaim it, so we need to continuously eat more. Okay, um, now that energy could then in turn be consumed by another organism. Remember that as an energy flows, we have that 10% rule. So only 10% of the energy you consume is then able to be passed on to the next level in a trophic chain. Okay, only 10% can go on to the organism that's consuming you because 90% of it you're using for homeostasis. You're using to maintain your own internal conditions, your own body, um, things like that. It's only the 10% that you put into your body tissues that can then be passed on to the next um, organism in a food chain. So as those nutrients are recycling, the other example they give over here is the leaves falling. And the same thing would happen if the elephant dies, right? The nutrients that are in its body, the nutrients that are in these leaves that are falling to the ground and are going to be decayed, consumed by the organisms in the soil, all of those nutrients eventually are going to end up in the soil itself. Then those minerals, those nutrients, those raw ingredients are going to be taken up by producers again by the plants in, in um, the plants growing and engaging in photosynthesis and reincorporated back into those simple sugars, those other tissues in their leaves and in their structure, which will be consumed by the next organism in the food chain. So that nutrients are really constantly going round and round and round, um, whereas the energy, we need this constant input from the sun. Great example here. Sunlight's coming in, we're producing this chemical energy here inside the fruit through photosynthesis. Um, the leaves are producing photosynthesis. The tree is then producing this fruit. Um, and remember that fruits are not also just for your enjoyment. They're a method of reproduction, right? So the, the fruit that you eat is the ovary. Um, and it's meant to pass on the seeds. Because if an organism, another animal, is going to pick up and eat that that um, that fruit, that ovary, then it's going to disperse the seeds and really spread the genes and spread those different um, individuals throughout the forest or throughout a, a given community. 
So that chemical energy comes in, it's consumed by um, the, the primate here, they're going to use that for their life processes, okay? Such as moving, jumping, um, avoiding predators, reproduction, and heat. So that energy is constantly being used and when it's given off, then it can no longer be reclaimed. Um, the plant is going to have to produce uh, more of that glucose, more of that chemical energy through photosynthesis for the um, consumers then to consume and eat again. Okay. Structure and function. Here's that theme that uh, we talked about so fondly earlier. The idea that the composition, the way living things are put together, is a direct correlation with their function. So a great example of this is the mitochondria. Here's your powerhouse of the cell. Mitochondria, according to um, the endosymbiont hypothesis, Um, proposed by Lynn Margulis, says that um, these mitochondria were once free-living prokaryotic organisms um, that became incorporated in a larger cell and through because they provided a benefit were for some reason not digested and instead and developed this kind of mutualism, this symbiosis between the two. And we have a few pieces of evidence for this. Um, one of them being that things like mitochondria and chloroplasts actually have their own DNA. They also have a double membrane. Now, not um, by double membrane, I don't mean the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, they have that, but they have two of those. They have an inner and an outer membrane. Here you can see that outer membrane. And the outer membrane is very much like the membrane of eukaryotic organisms. The inner membrane here is very much like a prokaryotic, like bacteria. So we have we have a few different pieces of evidence here. Um, and the mitochondria can reproduce by themselves. They don't require the DNA in a cell to reproduce. They have their own DNA to do that reproduction. But mitochondria are really your powerhouses of the cells. And um, we're going to take advantage of something called the concentration gradient in order to make ATP. Mitochondria's inner membrane is really convoluted. It's really folded. And again, just like your small intestine, the purpose of all these folds is to increase surface area. And increasing the surface area in this inner membrane of the mitochondria allows for more sites for APTP production to occur. Okay, a few notes about cells. This should be um, just a quick review from um, your first biology class. Is that um, the cell is the smallest level of organization, the lowest level that can um, complete all of the activities required for life. So it's the smallest unit that's still considered alive. Okay, all cells are enclosed by a membrane, whether it's a prokaryote or a eukaryote, they all have a membrane to contain them. Um, one of the big differences, however, between a prokaryote and eukaryote is that a eukaryote has membrane enclosed organelles within it, whereas a prokaryotic cell like a bacteria doesn't. Okay? And all cells have DNA and they use that DNA as their genetic information. The ability now of cells to divide and grow and make replications of themselves is, is what makes multicellular life possible. It's what makes you and I possible that we're here, um, is that we are composed of trillions and trillions of cells. So let's talk a little bit more about the different flavors of cells that we have available. We have our prokaryotic cells and we have our eukaryotic cells. Okay. Um, some of the main differences you can see right off the bat. Prokaryotic cells are much smaller. Okay. Prokaryotic cells are things like bacteria. Okay. They're much smaller. They don't have membrane and closed organelles, although they still do have a cell membrane. Okay, they still do have a cell membrane um, that you can see here on the outside. Oftentimes, they also have a cell wall around them. Okay? Eukaryotic cells are much larger, and you can see they have a variety of different membrane enclosed organelles here. Okay? Um, and their DNA is not naked like in a prokaryotic cell. It's actually contained inside the nucleus of the eukaryotic cell. Let's go through and just kind of refresh our mind on what the, the differences are here between these two different types of cells. So over here, let's talk about our eukaryotic cells. And we'll talk about our prokaryotic cells. So 
So eukaryotic cells are um, everything other than bacteria. So we're talking here things from kingdom, the plant kingdom, animal kingdom, fungi kingdom, and the abundant kingdoms um, that make up protists. Whereas prokaryotic are really just bacteria. Okay. And those archaebacteria, those extremophiles. Um, eukaryotic cells are much larger than prokaryotic cells. The key difference is that eukaryotic cells have membrane enclosed organelles. And this is the biggie, okay? This is the really important one. These membrane-enclosed organelles allow compartmentalization. And compartmentalization allows an organism to have a much more specific degree of regulation. So it increases their ability to regulate. Okay? Because now we can separate different metabolic processes. So the packaging of proteins happens in a different place than um, other organic molecules are broken down. The replication of DNA happens in a different place that's protected from other cellular machinery that's breaking things down. So we're really separating these things out. We allow a lot more fine-tuned control, and we can have lots of life processes going on at the same time in their own compartments where they're not interfering with each other. This isn't the case for prokaryotic cells. So they have no membrane-enclosed um, organelles. They have naked DNA. Okay, it's loose in the cell. It's not protected in the nucleus. Prokaryotic DNA is also typically circular. Okay, and they may have extra pieces of DNA called plasmids that are separate from their one main chromosome. Okay, but don't let their deceptively simple nature fool you. Prokaryotic cells are the most successful thing on the planet, okay? Um, and they reproduce very quickly because if they don't, somebody else takes over the toilet seat, okay? Prokaryotic cells are incredibly evolutionary significant. Um, they're driving the development. They're driving the evolution of different eukaryotic organisms. Disease is one of the few things that still is pushing at the human race, okay? They're very efficient. And... Um, they don't necessarily have fewer genes than you do, okay? They do have a lot of genes in that relatively small amount of DNA. So these are kind of the key differences between eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. Uh, and, and prokaryotic cells have that cell wall. In bacteria, they have a peptid or glycan cell wall. That peptide meaning protein, glycan meaning glucose. So that's different than, say, fungus who have a chitinous cell wall or plants who have a cellulose cell wall. Um, one of the defining characteristics of bacteria is that they have this peptidoglycan cell wall. 